Our scripture passage this morning uh, is from Psalm 69, verses 30 and 32. Psalm 69, verses 30 and 32. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who see God, let your hearts revive. This time of year, the holiday season, is a time where people tend to think about things that are most important to them. Uh, we focus on faith and on family, on friends, people who do not attend church normally show up at Christmas. People who do not believe in Jesus are singing joy to the world, the Lord has come. It's a weird time of year for that. Now, some of that is accidental, I know. The holidays often elicit feelings of nostalgia and people that cause them to sing songs they don't believe or go to events they don't fully understand and participate in traditions they don't fully grasp. If you've seen a Hallmark movie, you understand that that's true. Um, people love Christmas without loving the Christ of the holiday. But if you can get through the kitsch and the mere tradition and get down to how Christmas can be beneficial for your walk with Christ, you start to look, through, look at what attributes can be cultivated, what traits can be built through the holidays. And so it's my goal for us this morning as we think through, uh, this is the last Sunday of the year, the last Lord's Day of the year, um, as we build from 2019 into 2020. Um, my goal is for us to kind of see what is an attribute of Christian character that should be cultivated, that we see, that we see um, commanded in God's word, that we see modeled in God's word, that we can, can utilize and be grown in, especially because we're take, kind of taking a break from our normal, exi- from our normal exposition. We're going through Genesis uh, with so many people out. I'm thinking, what, what, what can be beneficial for us as we kind of bridge this time before jumping back into Genesis 15 in a couple weeks? Now, I think the forgotten holiday, Thanksgiving, is maybe, where we, is maybe where we're going to see this trait that I want us to kind of grasp this morning. Uh, I say it's forgotten because some people want to start Christmas music and decorations the day after Halloween. You know who you are. Some of you guys want to jump immediately to, to Christmas. I love Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, I love the traditions of Thanksgiving. I love the fact that it's a day dedicated to football and food and family. The three F's. Uh, those are the, I love I love that that's the, that that's what it's today. There's no there's not um, Hallmark hasn't gotten a hold of Thanksgiving yet, right? We haven't we haven't we haven't um, monetized Thanksgiving so much yet. But the goal of the holiday is written into the name. Now what I'm what I'm going to say to you is I think that 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 as we enter from Halloween into Thanksgiving every year, we go into November December. Maybe one of the things we should be thinking about that that is cultivated not just in Thanksgiving but also in Christmas is the idea of Thanksgiving. The idea of thankfulness, cultivating a heart of thankfulness. Amid football and food and family gatherings, we're supposed to see how the things we have should generate in us an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude. Of course, the natural question that follows such an assertion is, well, to whom are we to be thankful? Thankful to who? Like When we just say, well, we need to be thankful, you can have people of all different stripes basically say, well, sure, we should be thankful. But the question is, to who are we thankful? The atheist, I think, really has no real answer to such a question. The non-Christian, also an atheist of sorts, has nothing much better. To be thankful means you have to recognize you've been the recipient of something from someone else. And I think sometimes when people say we should be thankful, what they mean is, I want to thank myself for being as good as I am. I'm thankful that my hard work got me here. I'm thankful that my ingenuity got me these things. I'm thankful for the house I have because of the things I did to get there. And so it's really a way of just patting ourselves on the back. Is that what thankfulness is, though? Is that what Thanksgiving is supposed to be about? Not the holiday, but the idea of Thanksgiving. Is that what that's supposed to be about? To be thankful means you recognize you've been the recipient of something from someone else. From a giver of gifts, someone has, had, has to have blessed you for you to be blessed. Now, you go, how did you jump into this? Is this just purely a holiday message? It's not. Uh, we're going to be going through three verses in Psalm 69 that Randy read earlier. But the idea for this really stuck out in my head um, when we started, when we we're going through Genesis 14, when you're looking at Melchizedek, and we're talking about Melchizedek being the one that blessed Abraham. And that we're reading through Hebrews, the part of Hebrews where it says that the that one has to be blessed by someone greater than them, right? The lesser doesn't bless the greater. The greater blesses the lesser. And I think that's the idea of this is that, that the recipient of something is by, is by nature less than the one who's the giver. 
Maybe not in totality, but in that moment, in that gift, the receiver of something is the one who has been blessed by someone who is greater than them. So to be thankful to the giver of gifts is to recognize subservience underneath the greatness of the one who is giving gifts. And so thankfulness is, a, is, is by nature humbling. It's by nature exercising humility. It's showing that someone greater than me has given me something. And if we're really thinking through it, we recognize that he's giving me something I don't really deserve. Which is grace. Someone has to have blessed you for you to be blessed. If you're going to hashtag bless on Instagram, you have to recognize that someone has blessed you. Someone has to have given for you to have received. I think Thanksgiving has to be an odd holiday for those that think they've received nothing and that God does not exist. But I think this entire season helps cultivate this attitude. If we're willing to get behind all the, the pomp and circumstance of the holidays and start thinking through, how can I grow as a Christian? How can I grow in Christ-like attitude and, and, uh, and and sanctification during this time, I think we can start thinking this. The general attitude of thanksgiving to the, to the gift giving and receiving of Christmas, we're reminded that we have received something for which the proper attitude is thankfulness. To the name of thanksgiving, we have this idea. Now, my goal for us today is to help us transfer that thinking into worship of God, maybe, but maybe also to provide you a means of talking with friends and relatives to transition how they can see the gifts of God and how they ought to respond to Him as well. So this can be evangelistic in nature if we kind of take this to heart. The passage, these three little verses are huge to me, training us into seeing the need for us to be thankful and how thankfulness is an act of worship. And conversely, how a lack of thankfulness is really sin. Sinful rebellion against God. Look with me again at the passage that Randy read. Uh, and, and we'll read it again, all three verses, with this in mind, and then we'll walk through it. Look at verse, chapter 69 of Psalm, Psalm 69, verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. Now, here's going to be our approach. I want to take this passage. I want to pan back and take a big picture approach. And we're going to kind of start wide angle lens and kind of start zooming in on it as we move forward. We're going to narrow our focus again through this passage. Now, I want us to think through a theology that has as its center the glory of God as the meaning of life and the driving force behind our action that results in thanksgiving. That results in an attitude that we see here in Psalm 69, verses 30 through 32. All right, so we're going to develop the application from that. So that's, that's the, the, the structure of what we're going to be going through. So as we celebrate Thanksgiving uh, um, of Christmas, it's helpful to think about what it means. Yes, football and food and family and tradition and giving gifts, but it's more about an attitude or a change of focus to where we think not of just the gifts or the things we have and love, but we so focus on Christ as the giver of all good things. I've really learned over the years that the reason God gives us all these things is not so that we will be happy. The lie of American uh, quasi-religious fervor is that God exists to make us happy. God does not exist to make us happy. We exist to glorify God. And God is at work in us to make us holy. To make us more like Him. God gives us things not to make us happy, but to make us thankful. So that we will worship. So that we will do what we are created to do. If we are created to worship, then what God gives us is a means to get us to worship. The things that you have, the blessings you have, when you look around at the blessings of your family, you look around at a husband or a wife or kids or whatever is around you, the reason that God has given, to you, given those to you, first and foremost, there are many reasons why, but first and foremost is so that you will worship Him as the one who gave them to you. God, God's goal for you is to worship Him. You are created to worship. The focus of all creation is God's glory. So our response to Him is, this will be one of thankfulness and worship where we exalt him and see him high and lifted up and deserving of the glory that he actually deserves. We exist to glorify God. God does not exist to give glory to us. Sometimes we treat God as if he were a genie in a lamp or a fairy godmother whose sole mission in life is to make us happy, but that's not true. God does not exist for us. We exist for God. Why does God act? What is God's motivation for his actions? Well, in Isaiah 48, 
God is explaining through the prophet Isaiah why he's going to bring judgment to Israel, and he does it to refine them, to purify them. But he explains a deeper motivation in these verses. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 48. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. Right? So he's deferring his anger for whose sake? Not for their sake, for his own sake. And he says this, for the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you. So he does it for his own sake, for his praise, he restrains, he defers his anger, that I may not cut you off. Now we would think, well, if God refrains his judgment from us, it's because, look, he looks down and, has, and, and sees how great we are. And he goes, well, I can't do that to them. I can't judge them. We must be great then. See what God has done for us? Look how awesome we are that, God, that the God of the universe has done this for us. And he reminds the people of Israel, uh, it's not for your sake that I do this. It's for my own sake. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, he repeats this, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God acts for the sake of his people, but out of concern for his glory. Out of concern for his namesake. He acts for his own sake. He's acting for himself, for his reputation. As Christians, our sole mission should be in line with his, to make his name great. We exist to bring glory to God. That's why we're here. What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? That, this is why. We exist to glorify God. I think this is what Isaiah is getting at in Isaiah 26, verse 8. This was the, the um, when I was in college, this was kind of the, the key verse of the whole passion movement. Um, this was the John Piper, back, back before there was like passion CDs, there was a conference and all this kind of stuff. And the whole thrust of it was this verse. So this verse has been stuck in my head since I was 19 years old. Indeed, while following the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you eagerly. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. And I, I learned that in the NIV, um, which was your name and your renown are the desire of our souls. God's people are focused on God receiving glory. God's people are focused on God's name. His name being made great. His name, name being remembered. Here's what's so interesting. That's the, the thrust of why we belong to God. So it's our goal, our mission as Christians. We get sidetracked, it seems, by making our own names great. Well, I've got to build a platform. I've got to, I've got to make sure that my name gets out there. People have to know how good I am. We don't exist to make ourselves great. We exist to make God great. Again, tying this into the story that we have just been going through in Genesis, when God tells Abram, uh, you remember in Genesis 12, they're, 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 we have the whole Tower of Babel scene. Or Genesis 11, Tower of Babel. And the people go, we're going to build this tower to God. We're going to build this ziggurat. We're going to get to God because we want to make a name for ourselves. That was, the, that was their reasoning. The reasoning for building the tower to ba of Babel was basically, we're going to build this tower up, we're going to dethrone God, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. God laughs at that, basically, destroys them, spreads them out over the face of the earth. Then the very next thing is God goes into the middle of Ur of the Chaldees. He looks down and he sees a man, Abram, and he says, Abram, hey, Abram, um, I am going to make your name great. Abram's goal is not to make his own name great. God says he will make his name great. But what's interesting is the goal of Abram's name being made great by God, not by Abram. He doesn't say, Abram, go make your name great so that I will be made great. He says, I'm going to make your name great so that you will be a blessing to the nations. What, how, does that, how does that work? How will he be a blessing to the nations? Because the gospel will then go out from him to the nations so that people will come and worship God. So the end goal of Abram being made great by God, not by Abram, is God getting glory. We exist to make God's name famous throughout the universe. In fact, do you know why you're saved? It's not because you're great or because God needed to save you. It's not that God was lonely. You were saved so that through the church, through all the people redeemed by God, he, could, he would make his name great. I want to show you proof of that. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Leave your bookmark in Psalm 69. We haven't even started there yet. This is just a really long introduction. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul's telling them of the great mystery that Jews and Gentiles together make up the body of Christ, that we are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. Uh, that's verse 6. But look with me at verse 7, Ephesians chapter 3. 
of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the, pl- what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God created a people. God created, God created all things. God saved a people so that his wisdom would be declared in the heavenly places to rulers and authorities. Why are we saved? So that he receives glory, so that his wisdom is proclaimed to all the peoples, to everywhere, to all creation. Verse 11 says this was God's plan all along. This was his eternal purpose to be carried out through Christ. God's plan was always to use the church, both Jew and Gentile, saved by him, brought into one body, to make his wisdom known throughout the world, throughout the heavens. God sent Jesus to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to die on the cross, taking on the sins of those whom he would save, and then raise him from the dead. Why? It was his plan to make his wisdom known to all the rulers and authorities in the heavens. His plan for what? To make his plan known? To make his wisdom known? But his plan what? To save sinners, yes. But his plan was ultimately to glorify himself in the saving of sinners. So even when we reap the benefits, he is receiving the glory. And you go, oh, well, that, that makes God just, that, that makes God very self-centered. What would, for us to do, to bring glory to anything other than the greatest being in the universe is idolatry. Right? If God is the greatest being in the universe, for us to glorify anything above him is idolatry. For him to do the same thing would be idolatry. He doesn't make us greater than him. In his love, he is bending down to us and showing us mercy and grace because he genuinely loves us, but he does not exalt us higher than himself. He still has his glory in mind because to not have his glory in mind would be idolatrous. And God is no idolater. God exists for his glory, and therefore we exist for his glory. Believers have always understood this to be true. The Westminster Catechism starts off with this. What is the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But it feels like we've lost this mindset in theology in the church. We're so self-centered and man-centered that we believe God must be as well. Again, God doesn't exist to make you happy or to glorify you. If you believe that, then you're backwards. God doesn't exist to make you healthy or wealthy or give you your best life now or to make you happy or to give you everything you dream for. God does not exist to glorify you. You exist to glorify him. Doesn't this change our outlook on life? You live your life now not to earn favor with God. You can never do that. Only Christ's death on the cross earns favor with God. But you live your life as someone saved by Christ as an act of worship. Every decision you make, everything you do, should be done to glorify God with God and his glory in mind. People are wandering around this world. and They're wondering why they're here, what their purpose is. And God's word clearly tells us it's to glorify him. People are spending millions of dollars to have spiritual gurus tell them what their purpose in life is. They're spending billions of dollars on junk books at the bookstore to find out what their purpose in life is. And guess what? We have that purpose right here in our hands. Why aren't we opening our mouths and telling people? Why do you, why do you exist? You want to know why you're struggling so, right, so much right now? You want to know why your life is miserable right now? Because you are oriented in the wrong direction. You're focusing on trying to make yourself happy and glorify yourself. And you will always find that futile. You will always find that wanting. You'll always be unhappy, miserable, depressed. The reason why we spend billions upon billions of dollars on drugs to make us happy is because so many of us, I'm getting beyond, I'm not making a decision about health issues here. There's clinical issues. But the reason why most people are depressed is not because of health issues, because they're just not happy with what's going on in their life because they're focused in the wrong direction. Your existence... is not accidental. And this is where I want you to really take heart on this. You have a purpose and a reason for existence. Your existence is not accidental. You are not the result of mere happenstance. You're not just the latest stage in the evolutionary process. You're not just the result of random, random firing of synapses in your brain. You are not accidental. You are not incidental. 
You are not purposeless. You were made to glorify God, not generically, but specifically. God gave you language and skills and abilities and minds and bodies and souls. Again, these are not just the result of evolutionary accidents. They are purposeful creations of God so that you can grow and flourish and ultimately glorify him. I think that's the point that Paul is getting at in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the knowledge, wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I think verse 36 in there is really the key. For from him and through him and to him are all things. From him. Everything comes from God. God is the creator. is the beginning of it all. He made it all. Nothing exists that, did not, that he did not first make. Even mosquitoes exist because God ordained. As crazy as it is to think about that. Everything good comes from God. And here's the, here's the part that we don't always talk about. Even the things that we don't see as good come from God. The things that we might see as bad, or we might declare bad, come from God. Unless you can find a way out of all things. And I don't think you can textually. All things is pretty encompassing. Like you can go back to the well, in the Greek, all things. What well, means all things? Everything. Through him, so all things are from him. All things are through him. Or right? he dispenses all things. Not only is he the the where they find their genesis, they don't just find their creation in him, but he's the dispenser of things. They come through him. He gives it to people as he pleases. James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from God. We have nothing apart from God giving to us. We, again, we as Americans have a hard time with this truth because we view ourselves as picking ourselves up by our bootstraps. We own our own businesses and we can make or break ourselves or so we think. Everything we have is from God. We didn't generate anything on our own. God gives it. These gifts find their origin in him, but also he's the means by which we get them. We are recipients. We receive because things come through him to us. So they're from him. They're through him. They're to him. Everything's on its way back to him. He gets the glory. He gets the credit, the honor. All things are created by God for God. Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord, our, God, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you create all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And that's the end goal. God's glory is the main deal here. God has created all things, has worked all things, he's done all things, so that by all things he will get all the glory. God is very God-centered. If you're going to walk away with a point from the sermon, you, hopefully you're getting that so far. We're to be very God-centered. Now, here's the thing. I feel like I've laid out this theology before, and we've talked about this in some ways. Maybe not in this exact same way, but we've talked about this idea. And I think maybe most of us are on the same page. All right, we get it. God is for God's glory. We should be for God's glory. The question I want to ask, I think that Psalm 69 actually helps us, is how are we to be for God's glory? What do we do in response to that? It's one thing to check the theological box and go, agreed. God is for God's glory. We should be for God's glory. The next step is we go, how can, how can we do that? How do we demonstrate that we are for God's glory? How do we demonstrate that we are not about ourselves, but that we're about God? I think that's where Thanksgiving comes in. Not the holiday, the attitude. Look with me at Psalm 69 again. Like I said, that really was the longest introduction in the history of sermons. So start my timer now. I'm just kidding. For those of you that are visiting, are like, oh my gosh, he's serious. <laughs> just kidding. Look at Psalm 69, verse 30. Here you have the psalmist writing this. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. This is a call to believers, those who seek God, for those, for those people to have their hearts revived, to be alivened again, to be brought to life. This will please the Lord. What is this? What is it that we're doing that will please the Lord more than an ox or bull with horns and hooves, right? That's more than sacrifice. What is it we could possibly do that is greater than sacrifice? And the answer is, we praise the name of God with a song and magnify him with thanksgiving. Right, you say we just work backwards from 32 to 31 to verse 30? The goal of this whole thing, how we glorify God, greater than offering a sacrifice, is you humble yourselves and you show thanksgiving. 
You have a thankful heart to God for what he's given. I'll praise the name of God with a song. I'll magnify him with thanksgiving. This is to be the attitude that all God's people are to have. If we recognize that God acts for his glory and God gives because he chooses to give, he acts out of his own character and out of his own will, then receiving from him is purposeful. It's intentional. His gifts to us are for our good and have a reason. That means all the good things we have are from him. That means every good and perfect gift and every gift which is good and perfect, but yet we still struggle to see it so. All those things come from God. The things that God is using to refine us and perfect our character. This is for our good. So the right response from God's people is praise. Praising God with a song. Magnifying God with thanksgiving. I think those in some ways are synonyms. They, they, are, they are related ideas. It's not, well, here are the two steps to, to demonstrating worship to God. You praise God with a song, step one. You magnify God with thanksgiving, step two. I think those are the ideas. Those are the same kind of things talked about in different ways. The way that we exhibit thanksgiving is through song. And you go, I'm a horrible singer. Sure, certainly God doesn't want me singing all the time. That's not the idea. It's a, the, the idea of a song is that something comes from inside of you that you can't help but open your mouth and get, get out. This is not put on. This isn't just coming here and, and singing through the words on the screen or sitting here and being quiet while everyone else sings the words on the screen. That's not that kind of idea of, of, of glorifying God with a song. The idea is that it becomes such a part of you that when you open your mouth, this is what comes out. Thanksgiving is what comes out. Now, the right response from God's people is praise, praising God with song, praising God with our words or with our attitudes. We see this throughout the Psalms, Psalm 48, 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 40, verse 16. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. All right? It doesn't mean we walk around and we go, well, here's our song. We just sing great is the Lord forever and ever, over and over and over again. No, how do, we open our mouths and by the things that we say about God, we are saying great is the Lord, great is the Lord, great is the Lord. Right, it's not a mantra to be repeated. It's an idea that should emanate through everything we say about who God is and how we view the world around us. And I want us to focus on this phrase this morning, I will magnify him with thanksgiving. What does it mean to magnify something? Now, here I am leaning heavily on uh, something I heard from John Piper 20 years ago. Man, I'm getting older. 22 years ago, when I was 19. And I love this because this really, really helps me think through how it is that we can magnify God with thanksgiving. You can go two ways with this. You could mean this when you magnify something. What does it mean to magnify something? You could go two ways. One, you could mean that you take something that's very small and you blow it up to where it's greater than it is. Right? That's a, that's, we magnify things that way. That's what we do when we magnify things with a microscope. Right? A microscope is taking something that's very small that you wouldn't be able to see with your naked eye. And you magnify it so that, oh, now we can see it. That little bitty thing in there, in that Petri dish, that little bitty thing in there, I can now see by looking through this magnifying glass, through this microscope. Take a slide, some organism, put it on the microscope. Because it's hundreds and thousands of times bigger than it really is. That's one way of magnifying things. I don't think that's what's being talked about here. The other way we can magnify something is you take something that appears small and you make it appear as big as it really is. That's the work of a telescope. Right? You look through your telescope at the moon. When you look at it with the naked eye, you go, oh, look, it's the size of a quarter. You look at it through a telescope and you start to see all the contours of what the moon is. Is the moon really the size of a quarter? No, the moon is huge. Is the moon really what we can see there? No, we're taking something far away that, that it seems small to our naked eye, but through the, uh, the ability to magnify something, we make it appear greater than what it appears to our naked eye, more like what it is really. That's what we do in Thanksgiving. We are like telescopes making great the glory of God. The glory of God that is so great that to the world around us, pushes it down. They suppress that truth and unrighteousness, as Roman ones, Romans 1 says. People around us, even our own natural tendency is to suppress the truth of, of the reality of the greatness and glory of God. We take what is really big and huge, and we tend to push it down into something really small. And what Thanksgiving does is it magnifies God's glory so that he is more like who he really is. You follow what I'm saying here? 
When David says, I will magnify him, it doesn't mean I'm going to take a small God and make him look bigger than he really is. He means I'm going to take a God who is huge and make him out to be as big as he really is. Our goal as believers is to be telescopes in our lives and to the people around us. Our response to our gifts, not just our talents and obvious blessings, but our circumstances, even our difficulties, is to magnify God. So now this is going to put some flesh on this for us. How do you magnify God in the circumstances of your life? Well, I think one of those keys is we, we start to see the world in such a way that we can speak out. The song that kind of emanates out from us is, Great is the Lord. The way we respond to our circumstances will either praise God and make much of Him or will diminish God and obscure Him. Right? In even our own minds, our problems, our difficulties become so great that we push God into the background and we go, our problem becomes God. Or we think, I'll handle this, I become God. Or we can stop and realize, no, God is still God and He's in control of this and maybe He has given this to me for a reason. We're to magnify God and make God out to be as big as God really is. We serve an infinite God, a God with no beginning, no end, who created all things by the word of his power, who saves sinners, who's in complete control over his universe and everything in it. He deserves to be magnified. And guess what? You get to do that. You get to do that. We live in a world that does not glorify God. We live in a world that even sees the thing God's, God does and rejects him. It's interesting that it's man's natural response to God is not to honor him. And in fact, in Romans 1, uh, well, I mentioned that we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Listen, listen to the words of Romans 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, and here's the next phrase, or give thanks. You see how the, the means of idolatry, the means of suppressing God, is by not giving thanks to God. It seems to me that I, I, I've read, that, I read through Romans dozens of times, and I always skip over that part. It, doesn't reg, it didn't register to me that the way that people dishonor God and reject God is primarily through not giving thanks to Him. They did not honor Him or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Man's natural response to God is to not honor him and not give thanks. Yet those are the exact things David says in Psalm 69 that God's people do. They glorify or honor him and they give thanks. Isn't that interesting? It's almost as if this, these couple of verses are in the mind of Paul as he's pinning down Romans 1. How do people reject God? They rebel against Him. They don't honor Him as God, and they don't give thanks. And Psalm, the psalmist, thousand years before, says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify Him with thanksgiving. The response is what all of us apart from Christ do. He does, we do not give God glory that He deserves. We reject Him. Every single person who's not saved has rejected God, refused to worship Him. All of us who are saved used to be in the same boat until He gave us a new heart, removed the scales from our eyes, and caused us to see. Even now as believers... We don't glorify God as we ought to, do we? We struggle with this. We find ways to turn our blessings back into us being proud of our accomplishments. Look, what I, look at the success I am. Look at what I did. Even after God reminds us that he's the one who blesses and we think, I'll never forget this truth. I'll, I'll never go back to this, God. How quickly do we see ourselves yet again into thinking we picked ourselves up and did this for ourselves? How quickly do we fa fall into despair or discouragement or fail to see God's blessings and our difficulties instead of seeing it as a means of sanctification of growth? We blame God. I think this should be a reminder to us that God is great and all that we have, He gives. All that He gives is good. I think David, the psalmist, had to be reminded of this too. So I think we're in, in good company. The psalmist seems to be reminding himself of this. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and listen this, this phrase, and forget not all his, all his benefits. Let's remind himself to, as it's a song that is reminding us, don't forget. Don't forget his benefits. Don't forget his blessings. Why? We tend to forget. Asaph in Psalm 77 does the same thing. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your strength among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people. We need to rehearse those ideas in our minds so that we don't forget. So as believers, we magnify God. We're to give God glory and honor. Now, how do we do that? Now, the text says give thanks. What does it mean to give thanks? Well, first, 
It's an acknowledgement that someone has given you something. It's a statement of thankfulness to that person, or in this case, God, for all that he is and what he has done. If someone gives you a gift and your response, your response is not to make a big deal about how great you are to get a gift, right? I don't think any one of us on Christmas morning this past week, when someone gave you a gift, you go, this is a big one. It better be because I'm good. Or someone hands you a small box and you go, is this what you think of me? This small little gift? Don't you know how great I am? No, we, our response is what? Thankfulness. Someone gives you a gift. It would be ridiculous for someone to walk up to me and give me $100 and then for my response to be, you have no idea how much I deserve this $100. I've been great. Honestly, I really deserve this gift you've given me. Honestly, this is actually short selling me a little bit. I deserve 10 of those. So, sir, the right response is, thank you. The person gave you a gift. He's, and not only that, they gave you a gift they were under no obligation to give. Otherwise, that would be called a payment, not a gift. When you say thank you, when you give thanks, you are recognizing the goodness of the person giving you the gift. Benefactors are greater than beneficiaries. And how much greater is God than human givers? God, uses, Jesus uses this kind of analogy. If, if a father would do this for his child, how much greater is our father in heaven? If we would give each other gifts, how much greater is the giver of all good gifts? When we give thanks to God, we're recognizing his greatness. We are magnifying God. We are making God's name great among the heavens. We are giving him the glory to his name. But secondly, as I mentioned before, it's an act of humility. Thankfulness is an act of humility. This is hard for us because we're not humble. We want glory. We want honor. We want God to make a big deal about us. We, we never want to admit our own shortcomings and failures. And that's why we make everything about us. But I've got good news for you. You can put to rest the pride. None of this is about you. The storyline is not about you. Your salvation isn't even about you. It's about God receiving glory. God's first priority is his glory. No. I don't believe I'm a humble person. I want glory and respect. I want people to make a big deal about me. I think that's pride. That's, that's sinfulness. Humility is something that God has had to work in me by showing me his greatness. Not, by, not necessarily by putting me down, but by putting me in the right perspective. Right? I, don't think the, I don't think the opposite of, of God esteem is us just destroying everybody else. Like we, don't, we don't get there by going, this is how lowly you are. This is how horrible you are. I think you, put it, you get there by putting it in perspective, by comparison to God. So I don't have to walk around going, you are garbage and trash. Don't you know that? You're trash. That's not how we get to humility. We get to humility by going, do you know how great God is? You see how high and lifted up he is? Do you see that God has created all things? That he spoke and, and things were made? And then he made you. So to put it in perspective, you are like this to God. That's how we get to humility. By seeing the greatness of God. The first step in all of us, though, is seeing ourselves as a sinner who has rebelled against that God. That puts things in, a, in proper perspective pretty quickly. I really believe the reason we have so many people who don't understand salvation in our churches is because we have so many people that don't understand that they've sinned against God. If all salvation is, is just us, as, well, there's been a broken relationship uh, listen, the, you, you, you're just not in right relationship with God. It's true, but why? Why are you not in right relationship? Because you rebelled against God. Read Ephesians 2 and tell me what God says about mankind and his sin. It's kind of hard to be proud after that. Salvation can never come to us until we see how truly sinful we are and how truly holy God is. That's what humility is. Seeing ourselves in light of who God is and, and how we've responded to his word. And that's where thanksgiving comes in. From a humble heart. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. A humble heart is a thankful heart. A Christian must have humility and thankfulness. I think that's why David writes in verse 31 of Psalm 69, This will please the Lord more than ox or bull with horns and hooves. Why does thanksgiving please the Lord more than bulls or goats? Uh, so you, you can see this. I'm going to read this to you. We're running out of time. Psalm 50, verse 9. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. This is God saying this to, to the people. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. So uh, why does he say that to them? Because he has commanded them to go to him and sacrifice, right? to atone for their sins by taking the blood of bulls and goats and birds. 
And then he says, um, listen, you understand that when you're doing this, you're not giving me something I don't already own. I own everything. When you offer up the cattle that is yours, this is not Gus going, listen, we're taking the best of what we have and we're giving to God because God needs this. He's saying, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. You think I need your dirty cow? I've got all that I need. I don't, I don't need anything from you. He goes on, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all it contains. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God, and here's what I love about this in Psalm 50. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And pay your vows to the Most High. Sacrifice is about thanksgiving. God is not enhanced by receiving anything. Man cannot give God anything. These sacrifices can cause man to think that God has something, that, that he has something God doesn't already own. But God says, I own all of it. Cattle, mine. Birds, mine. Goats, mine. If I'm hungry, I'm not talking to you about it. You're not going to help me out. You can't make me a sandwich. You can't do anything to fix my hunger if I were hungry. God wants what? A sacrifice of thanksgiving. He doesn't need stuff from us. It's just really a recognition of what God gives. What God wants from us is to go, you know what? All this is yours anyway. Which is why when we give offerings and tithes and those kind of things, all we're really saying there is not, well, God needs us. God's work, God will not survive if we don't pay him off. That's not what we're doing. What we're saying is, I recognize that none of this is mine anyway. God has given this to me to steward for a while. And the way that I can show my thanksgiving to him is to give some back to his people to be used for his kingdom. That's what we do when we give. It's a recognition that God gives and we receive, not the other way around. I think this is also pictured in the gospel of Christ. You cannot live a holy life to be considered holy, but God provides a savior to, to live the life God demands. You cannot sacrifice enough to make you holy, but God provides a sacrifice in Christ Jesus. We cannot earn favor with God because we cannot keep the law of God, yet he sends Christ to fill the law's demands and to die as a substitute for his people on the cross, and then he raises them from the dead. And what role do we play? We are those who are saved by the mercy of God. We then worship the one who saves us with a thankful, humble heart. I love this. You, you read somewhere that the only thing we bring to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. That's what role we play. We're mere recipients. We're not workers who have earned something. We are those who have nothing. Nothing to offer. Nothing to prove. Nothing to gain. Nothing we can gain on our own. We are simply recipients. And what are recipients supposed to do in response to being given something? Thankful. What is worship? It's about thankfulness. All that we provide our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. Even the faith we exercise to be saved, God gives as a gift through, through the power of His Spirit. His word is preached. His Spirit works. He applies the benefits of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. He gives us new life. He gives us faith. He gives us new hearts and minds. And all the blessings that follow come through Him as well. We respond in thankfulness. Why, why do we pursue holiness? Out of thankfulness. Why do we meet with other believers? Out of thankfulness. Why do we worship God one day a week? Out of thankfulness. Why do we take care of those around us? Out of thankfulness to the God who's given us all things. We respond with thankful hearts and minds. We respond in worship and praise to the one who saved us. That's why I love how verse 32 ends. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. This is a life-giving message. Be thankful. You don't have to work. You don't have to, to do anything to earn God's favor. You rest in His finished work on the cross. You rest in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. You trust in that, and God has saved you, and now you respond to God, not by giving Him things back. Well, we've got to pay Him back for what He's done for us. No, you, you pay Him back. You, you respond to Him. You can't pay Him back. You respond to Him with thankfulness. You respond in thankfulness. Thankfulness looks like worship. Thankfulness looks like self-sacrifice. Not to earn God's favor, but just to respond to what God has done to you. Believers, this is good news for us. We serve a God that is almighty and powerful and sovereign. May we be humble. May we be God-centered. May we be people who see God for who He is and respond with thankful worship. May we magnify God with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Father God, you are gracious to us far beyond what we deserve. We deserve your wrath. We deserve your judgment. But yet you give us grace in Christ Jesus. 
You sent Christ to die on the cross for our sins. You sent him to, to live a sinless life that, your, that his righteousness would be given to us. You raised him from the dead. And you have now given us this message. Preached to us. Seen through your word. You've called us to yourself. Lord, you have given us all things we, though we deserve none of it because you are great. May we magnify you in thanksgiving and response. May we trust in you. May we place faith in you. May we respond with worship. We pray this all in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.